what happened at the COP22 in Marrakesh isn't much. Um, no, one, no one doubts really uh, that there is a very important link between sustainable agriculture and food system and climate change because there is a two-way relationship. Agriculture suffers from climate change, but also a driver, of course, of emission and global warming. Um, but nonetheless, there was not uh, any real progress uh, in Marrakesh on either sides of the problem. Uh, the content and policy side, what can uh, climate change negotiations and climate change policies do to address these problems of agriculture suffering and driving climate change, but also the financing of climate change, can it help agriculture become less uh, riskful and, and you know, more resilient to climate change? Um, the first one, the content side, and it's a, it's a clear gap of the Paris Agreement. There is basically no detail in the Paris Agreement on what is the role of agriculture. So there was an ambition, of course, in Marrakesh compared to Paris to try and do that. Agriculture was very prominent, but in the end it didn't deliver really. I can make there a connection to what I've experienced around a month ago uh, at the Committee on World Food Security, the 33rd session of the CFS. That is the most important and foremost inclusive uh, multilateral UN body to discuss food security. And this year was focused really on what the CFS can do on uh, SDG2 in particular eliminating hunger and its connection with the rest of the SDGs, so quite a bit focused on climate change. So how can uh, climate change and food security process be better linked? Despite being a very promising tool, because it has a seat also for the private sector and the civil society, etc., a lot of enthusiasm about these SDGs, people talking about Marrakesh to make progress and joint progress together. But the CFS remains a bit like the COP22, a very you know sticky uh, negotiating process where people make their statements political, prepared, there is very little dialogue. So there also at the CFS we didn't go beyond uh, important statements and there was no real dialogue in particular between private and public sector. So that was a bit of a the miss out uh, that I saw uh, at the CFS in Rome, but also it was the reason why the negotiation on the content got stuck uh, in Marrakesh. Basically the northern part of the world wants to agriculture and climate change to be linked on mitigation the southern part of the world, G77, etc., want mostly that to become part of the adaptation efforts. There is quite an agreement internationally that there are three major problems with climate financing. One is uh, who are the beneficiaries of these resources and for what we do and for what a lot of uh, stakeholders in, in the south and developing countries say, you need to make agriculture stakeholders, in particular smallholder farmers, who are the majority of agriculture uh, actors in Africa and they're very important for worldwide food security to receive funds also from climate financing. Uh, but there is no clarity on what sectors should benefit from all these announced uh, large money to finance climate change action. Secondly, indeed, these large amounts, there is a reference to the Paris Agreement that by 2020 there should be 100 billion dollars per year devoted to climate action. There is no clarity on how this is counted, who's going to put it, so there was an, an hope that in Marrakesh there would be clarity on it. Again, no clarity, just an agreement to keep talking about the details of this. And lastly, the procedures around the climate financing. If you take the, uh, the Green Climate Fund, which is the largest the mechanism to deliver these resources, the, the cumbersome procedures make it very difficult exactly for the weaker players like small orders, but even the Ministry of Agriculture to access it. Again, there was no possibility to agree uh, on all of this. If, in a multilateral setting, you cannot get out of this negotiating mood, then maybe, in the case of financing, the donor community, uh, possibly in 2017, could take the lead on unblocking some of these problems. There are two, at least, important events next year. The G7, uh, under the Italian presidency, which in 2009, under the same presidency, launched the L'Aquila Food Security Initiative, has a possibility to say something about climate finance and agriculture, but also the European Union and the African Union have an important ministerial meeting next year. So there is a possibility in this context, I think, for either the EU and the largest donor in the world, or the G7, together with the other parts, uh, of course, like the United States, who are very important donors, to devote, maybe, and stay explicitly that their resources going into, for example, the Clean Climate Fund, a particular share of it should be dedicated to climate change action, and in particular adaptation, which is the most important for Africa and the, and the developing world. There, for example, these resources could end up financing a very important initiative that was announced in Marrakesh, but again, it was only announced how much it would cost, uh, without concrete commitments financially, 30 billion euros 
uh, would be needed to uh, complete this initiative that is called uh, Adapting Agriculture in Africa, AAA. Lastly, the EU uh, and the G7 could you know, explicitly point at uh, simplifying the procedure and make sure that smallholder access and agricultural stakeholders can benefit from the fund. On the side of the CDPM, this is all very complex, and as I said, what is missing often in this very um, uh, tight negotiating setting uh, it's, it's the possibility to prepare certain of the analysis with a bit more of a political economy eye, where you, you really are a bit more frank about the problems and what are the interests behind one or the other position, as well as more frank dialogue. So we at ECDPM do that in, in other processes, and we are stand ready to support uh, European, African stakeholders, the G7 and the <coughs> and European donors, but even the UN uh, stakeholders and in the CFS to try and prepare some of the ground in analysis, political economy analysis, and frank public-private dialogue, so that before you get to the negotiating rooms, there is a bit more consensus built in order to progress on this very important issue.